Hello. Hello. That's right. It is YouTube time this time all the time. If you like poetry, if you like literature, if you like cultural history, then you've come to the right place. We make podcasts about all of those things. So be sure to like and share this video. And of course, most importantly, subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. Since we mostly make podcasts, you can also find our shows on all the major podcast platforms. So if you found this video, but YouTube isn't your speed for regular podcast listening, head over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe there. All right. Hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to an all new episode of Close Talking. I am one of your co hosts, Connor McNamara Stratton. And I am your other co host, Jack Rossiter Munley. And we are greeting you in the new year. It Welcome. is 2020, folks. And who knows what's going to happen, but if you've heard anything, it's not looking good. Nope. I'm proposing 20. So obviously, 2018 was 2018, the year in which all good things happen. 2019 was 2019, the year to let your inner light out. I think 2020 (laughs) is going to be like, 2020, don't look back. (laughs) Yep. Really? Just close your eyes if you You, can. You just got to keep going. Yeah. You got to get through this one. This one, you might just have to get through. (laughs) Well, we'll see. But uh, in the meantime, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about a couple poems here and there. So... Uh, it's Close Talking, it's the, the podcast where we read a poem, we talk about it, and we read it again. And we've got another wonderful one for you today, as always. But before we get into it, our bi-monthly plea to rate our podcast, give it a little review, give it some five stars, write some nice things like, hey, great. Talking about poetry. Wow. Poetry is cool, and so is this podcast. Yeah, I mean, make it your That's own. That's a good one. Obviously, you know, do your thing. Right, uh, right. Yeah, use your own voice, but you could say, rarely have I ever encountered such a podcast that so thoroughly and refreshingly engages with both contemporary and traditional poetry, both scholarly and humorous. So, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to say, it's fine. It's oh fine. Don't even worry about it. You, you've thought about this more than I thought you had. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I have uh, got a lot of time on my hands. So anyway, it means a lot. It helps the algorithms. And uh, yeah, the poem we are discussing today is called Romance One. Uh, it's by Unsung Kim, who is a wonderful poet. She is a professor at Northeastern University. She's a poet. She also is a critic. And her debut collection came out in 2017. uh, And it's called The Gospel of Regicide, which is a pretty great title, if you ask me. So cool. Yeah, I think uh, we'll, we'll get into it. But, you know, I was just... Been thinking I've got climate change on the brain, and I think this was a maybe a poem of the day uh, by poets.org, which is might be where I first encountered it. So, shout out poets.org. Yeah, I just thought it was great. So, here it is Romance One by Unsung Kim. Like some 14 year old girl waiting for a crush to glance back, I keep waiting for capitalism to end. But it won't end, my adult life lover states, on what will end. Libraries, birds, retirement, recess, sprinting during recess, hispid hairs, starfish shaped like stars, inconvenience, wrinkles, sunken cheeks, living corals, protests, anti-nuclear proliferation, Non-aggression packs, dragonflies, mangosteen, DMZs, trade embargoes, leopards, all kinds, saw fins, rewilding, infiltration plot slash dreams, 
oak, trees, partulina variabilis, partulina splendida, violence prevention programs, news. News. Might a few jellyfish survive counting till revelations becomes part of Well, <laughs> that ending is chilling. I know. I it know. is really, yeah. I mean, the whole poem is, but like, what a stark and powerful way to just not end it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think you can, you can hear it, but um, on the page, it's it kind of ends with an M dash, counting till revelations becomes part of M dash, and you know. Presumably, it could become part of something, but that's where the poem ends. Fitting for a poem about all the things that will end. And, you know, climate change isn't mentioned sort of explicitly in the poem, but I think it becomes pretty clear from the list and the fact that it's kind of related to capitalism. But, you know, you have all these species, uh, you know, hispid hare, starfish, leopards, softens you know, trees, birds, etc., which I think snails. Yeah, the the two ones <laughs> are given in their proper Latin scientific name, Par Partulina variabilis and Partulina splendida are two kinds of snails, both of which I think are endangered. They are. Uh, I believe all of the different, I'm not sure about starfish generally as a category, but I know hispid hares are endangered, leopards are probably also endangered or close to, depending on which leopard, but... Yeah, definitely, probably some to most. <laughs> well, I know snow leopards for sure. Yes, those are definitely endangered, but I'm sure there's probably some starfish that are endangered, especially those, even if they're maybe not technically endangered by, like, the IUCN or whatever that makes the list of endangered species... Because uh, so many of them make their homes on coral reefs, you know, their fate is pretty tied up with the coral reefs, which are in rough shape. There was also the recent uh, social media phenomenon of the square starfish. And people you were tell. like, is that real or is it fake? And then scientists <laughs> had to come out and say, no, that can happen. <laughs> it's like a square starfish. There's also... There's also a very slow campaign of scientists to change it from starfish to sea stars because they're not technically fish, I think. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll get behind yeah. that. I mean, it, yeah. scientists, you know what? They know more about it than I do. They can do what it, they need to do. And this sounds like a good one. Um, there's also the crown of thorns starfish, which, if I remember correctly, doesn't look particularly starfishy, but is also known for, like, feeding on coral reefs and... Uh, is definitely one of those species that is associated with the climate change impact that is currently being felt on coral reefs specifically. Uh, and the yes. fact that it's not particularly star-shaped makes me wonder if it's perhaps being referenced just a little bit. Crown of thorn starfish are crazy looking. You should absolutely Google them. They have, in fact, a ton of thorns. Yeah, and I think from what I understand, because of warming oceans and runoff pollution and maybe acidity, but I'm not quite sure, there's been there's more algae uh, and algal blooms that are happening, and those starfish like those, and so it's caused sort of increases in their population. And actually, some amount of crown of thorn starfish are good because they eat some kinds of coral and not others. And so in certain proportions, it can actually help diversify the coral population. But when there's too many, then it's just a bad, it's a bad thing. But Google them because, wow. Yeah. One of the first times I became aware of them was in a documentary about how dust, which had been accumulating on the Great Barrier Reef because of droughts, was killing off huge portions of the reef. And now... This is potentially going to be another issue after all of the forest fire devastation in Australia is that uh, it's going to create even more smoke and debris that will end up possibly on the reef. So it's like the continual ripple effects of natural disasters. Um, and it's like kind of wild that there have been ongoing natural disasters 
with greater and lesser immediate like harm and impact on human beings going on in Australia for decades at this point. Yet another depressing marker of the severity and immediacy of climate change. But oh God, the fires are crazy. I mean, it's interesting. What I liked about this poem, I guess what would like the first kind of, I think it's such a great poem in a lot of ways, but it sort of has, it gets at this question of like, climate change is such a vast and its manifestation and existence is kind of, has certainly historically eluded the ability of people to talk about it in a way that humans can process. Part of that is, of course, just like capitalism and disinformation campaigns. But another part of it is, you know, how do you actually capture the nature of climate change in a way that's both accurate and comprehensible? Um, And you can sort of see how like one quote unquote comprehensible way to talk about it is just to talk about like apocalypse and like, you know, the movie the day after tomorrow or something like that, which is something that our narratives can hold. But of course, climate change is is working in different ways. And I think that there's been like in the non sort of literary artistic world, a lot of discussion about, you know, how do we communicate the issue in a proper way. But I think it's also been a a challenge for writers, even, you know, of novels and of nonfiction and of poetry to, to kind of capture it. And one thing that I, that I liked about it is like, I think there's a simple way of thinking about climate change, just sort of bringing about total end and nothingness, you know, and it's like, well, we're in the end times and blah, 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 which may happen. I mean, I'm not going to say that it's not going to happen, but there's lots of situations that are completely devastating that are nevertheless not exactly the end times. And like what this poem does in this kind of the list form is bring up a lot of specific things that could end that like you wouldn't normally associate necessarily with climate change. Some you would like leopards and living corals. You know, those are like things that we understand will be affected, you know, by and are being affected by climate change. But I think the other big thing that I've been reading about lately is like, like thinking about how climate affects our societies, you know, it puts pressure on, you know, infrastructure and institutions and societies in certain ways, you know, one often Quoted example is like the Syrian civil war and the drought that kind of at least played some role, certainly, um, in bringing that about. And that as those kinds of things, as more droughts, you know, there's going to be maybe like half a billion climate refugees in the next several decades or something like that. And you think about how the U.S. is already reacting disturbingly to refugees and migrants and immigrants, etc. So this poem is kind of like, I love the, the moments, you know, how the first thing that's mentioned that will end is libraries. And then it's like birds, retirement, recess, sprinting during recess, which is hilarious and also sad. But that, you know, this this kind of thing it makes you think like, oh, recess is like something that's dependent on schools and schools are dependent on like a somewhat stable like society in X number of ways. And even though it's such a short poem, I mean, it takes it's like just a list and with with sort of little bits of lyric line beginning and ending it through its specificity, it like captures such a. I don't know, I sort of like am able to comprehend like what's at stake in a way that is more real than like people just telling me like, it's going to shit. It's all going to shit. <laughs> Which like, I, I'm not, a, I'm not against people saying that, but like, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and that is exactly the challenge that the climate crisis and those who write and talk about it face, which is exactly what you were describing. How do you get people to care about this? Because there are only so many ways you can say this is a catastrophe. And in fact, elevated rhetoric can in many cases make it easier for the other side of the debate to the degree that there is another side. I mean that only rhetorically, not that there is a real other side to climate change, but it makes it easier for the other side to say, well, the world didn't end. So like, you must be wrong. 
um, which is complete nonsense. But like, I know some climate deniers who fancy themselves well informed, and what they usually point to are articles sounding the alarm about climate change from years ago. And they say, like, well, they were worried about something different then than they are now. And so clearly this is bullshit. And, like, good job, you've owned the libs, whatever. But <laughs> it it means that I think there is a limit. And I think people in the climate change writing and thinking community feel that pressure of, like, how do you get your message across to people who aren't already bought in? And in reading this poem, I was thinking about another issue where at least in the united states there's a scientific consensus and a popular uh, uncertainty which is evolution and there's like religious beliefs tied up in that and everything but with both of them there's this notion of threshold concepts that comes up and so like they are the thing you need to understand to have a real understanding of something so for evolution one of the big threshold concepts is deep time to understand how the process of evolution can take place how it makes any sort of sense and also to understand sort of humanity's place in like a more geologic time scale you have to have an understanding of something that humans are not really programmed to understand Um, the same thing kind of comes up around how we think about money and social inequality because it's really hard to imagine a billion and this is whether it's a billion years or a billion dollars it's not until you have this like breakthrough threshold concept reframing of a like subject it's really hard to actually think critically about it in a good way and i think the climate crisis is sort of like this because you can read a bunch of articles and maybe you agree and maybe you don't based on whatever your other stuff is but like you can agree with climate change read articles about it and think it's a problem and not really have a contextual understanding of what it means and that's what i love about how this poem works And I love that you drew out specifically that it starts with libraries, because that's one of those things. And I think it does this at a couple of points, especially at the beginning. It's pulling out things that you just take for granted that exist in the background of life that will disappear slowly, maybe without you really having to notice them. Like I would notice if my library was gone, but it's not one of those food, water, shelter things where you're like, we're in the end times. This is the crisis point. It's like, damn, I loved libraries. Um, however much you like love and value libraries and books and stuff, and maybe you go there every day, but like you'll still have a lot of amenities in a Western country, like a advanced country like the United States, which I think is the primary audience she's writing towards. Like you'll still get by in your day to day life without a library, maybe less so with birds or retirement, but like these are the things that slowly <laughs> fall away, you know. And I think it's also interesting that in addition to pointing to things that would go in the beginning lyric in saying, I keep waiting for capitalism to end with this sort of longing glance, yeah, (laughs) which I love. I love the phrasing like some 14 year old girl waiting for her crush to glance back. I keep waiting for capitalism to end. Like I was a 14 year old boy waiting for my crush to glance back. I remember what that's like. It's terrible. (laughs) uh and like nerve shattering uh and like so full of hope and anxiety yeah um but because that's the framing i'm also reading all of these not just as maybe markers of climate crisis and change but also markers of things that like will end because capitalism won't and like capitalism as a motive force for climate crisis yes But also, like, capitalism doesn't care about libraries. They're the least capitalist thing you can imagine. It's like, oh, free books for everybody that we all fund? Like, come on. Nobody's getting rich off that. Yeah. And, like, retirement. Yeah, never retire. Keep working. God, you're not worth (laughs) anything if you don't work. Capitalism. But I also (laughs) like that, like, inconvenience. Like, there's these things that are always framed as positives that will also be like, oh, we'll put an end to inconvenience. Everything will be super easy. You can just, like, there's an app for that don't worry about it um but also like wrinkles and sunken cheeks which wrinkles is like maybe cosmetic surgery and i think sunken cheeks is an interesting one because it kind of goes both ways to either oh we'll end hunger at the expense of like climate or there's like also cosmetic surgery for facial fillers to like get rid of your cheek wrinkles so yeah oh my god no i i'm loving all that the beginning is so good and it's like 
it's funny because it's like so apt in a way that I never because like with that kind of crush it's like a it's like it's the peak passion like hormones are like all out you're like I really really am into this person I wish it would end god please let, let it end it's also like such a classic unrequited it's never gonna end it's they're never gonna look at you I mean come on you're you're a little dweeb and it's like so naive and like but not like even when you know it's naive it's like you hope against hope this is my favorite uh my favorite description of this is when bruce springsteen was talking about this line he has in rosalita which maybe i've mentioned this on the podcast before because i love it but he (laughs) he points out that in this one line in the song he says we'll look back on this and it will all seem funny and it's that it's seem not be because it's not funny. All the emotions and feelings are real, but with the distance of time, you can acknowledge like how silly adolescent feelings are from like a more knowledgeable perspective. And I feel like that's what's being mobilized here so effectively because yeah, everybody feels that. Like you all remember what that feeling was like, that all-consuming like crazy teenage crush, and those feelings are real. And you can't do anything about it because you don't know anything yet. And like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it's like if you want capitalism to end. You're like, <laughs> oh, I just want it to happen. And like, <laughs> I, I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Capitalism I know. Capitalism has made us all teenagers. I know. Teenagers in love. <laughs> it's also such a like... And I don't want to say this part too strongly, but like the funny thing about those crushes is like, it's like you have desire and then it's like what you can do about it. And it's like what you can do about it is at an all time low. And like your (laughs) desire is at like all time high. Uh And it's just the most extreme of both situations. And I just for my own part, I do would love capitalism to end. And I feel so much of the time just wishing just like it's just a fa- it feels like a fantasy um which we can bring it to an end but anyway not the point the point is such a also so perfect because it's like such a i feel like it's such a in a poem to like both talk about capitalism like in an explicit way and also to use the word capitalism are i think often kind of risky moves because capitalism a it's a huge abstract concept b the word itself has like a lot of baggage in the same way that like god does or something or democracy and baggage is difficult sometimes because you just you bring in all the baggage into the poem and you're not necessarily trying to bring it all in and that can be a risk and also capitalism like has a kind of tonal register that either could be academic or like, you know, there's a certain kind, there are certain kinds of people who say capitalism, I guess, Uh, or at least when capitalism is said, people often hear, oh, you're the kind of person that says capitalism or whatever. It's a big honking word. It's a big honking word. You know, it's like, it's not quite, but it's in the same vein of like, you know, we need to bring down the cis heteropatriarchy or something like it's a termy term. And in a poem, termy terms can pose some problems, potentially. But I feel like because it's <laughs> it's contrasted with the 14-year-old girl crush, it's like just, it's a perfect pair. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. It just, to get away with that is just brilliant. Um, it, it turns it into a joke. It's like a laugh line right at the beginning of the poem. It's yeah. really, it's great because you're not focusing on the word capitalism. You're focusing on this jokey idea of how to think about it yeah, uh, or how to think about your relationship to it. And I think that that's such an effective way to handle it because I was, that was one of the first things that struck me as I was reading through this poem is like, wow, this isn't just a poem that's kind of about capitalism. Like, the words in there and like yeah as you're saying capitalism is a term that comes from like economics famously called the dismal science like (laughs) whether your poem's happy or sad it's hard to have it in there in its raw form you know um and if you're thinking about show don't tell like when you put capitalism in your poem you're always going to be kind of in attention with telling yeah exactly and this poem i think that's part of why this is so effective because it uses capitalism to show something else 
rather than tell us about capitalism. It shows us what, like some 14-year-old girl waiting for her crush to glance back, I keep waiting for capitalism to end. Capitalism is showing us what she's waiting for as opposed to telling us about capitalism. Yeah, and you're so right to to sort of reframe. I, I kind of had jumped in immediately with a reading that this was like a climate change poem, which I think it is, but it's also, you're right that like, it's also, it's a capitalism poem sort of first and foremost. And actually like holding both of those things together is kind of interesting because you're so right, like inconvenience is a thing that, you know, there's an app for that is like, you know, one of the the great foes that capitalism seeks to vanquish or whatever. But at the same time, it also makes me think of like when should climate change and, you know, maybe like the the extremities of capitalism, like sort of fully realize itself in its horrifying way, like worrying about something like inconvenience, like would also cease to end. It's like if you're to go crudely extreme, if you're in the end times, you're not thinking about something being inconvenient. Everything like, is inconvenient. <laughs> everything is inconvenient. And it, like the concept itself ends, I think, because it's like there are things more important. Like it's a luxury right now for me to be like, God, this was such an inconvenient thing to do. Like I had to go, I had to walk up the stairs. I had to, I didn't have service. Fucking Verizon, even though it's better than the other ones, blah, blah, blah. Even like negative feelings are an indication of privilege or just like being well off in some certain way. But at the same time, yeah, it's just it's the list is is great because it can be read in so many ways, I think, you know, because it's just like rather than these all being a sentence, it's like they're not being super super contextualized like they're not you know an object or a subject or a verb or whatever they're just like part of the the accumulation being described um which i think like opens them up yeah that really resonates with me because i also feel like the way that they're arranged is almost purposefully not to contextualize each other because i can make groupings out of this on my own separate from the way they're listed that kind of make sense and i think there's even probably a reordering of this list which i haven't played around too much with that would maybe in a more linear way build to something but like natural world stuff is interspersed with like socio-cultural economic stuff positive stuff or what could be seen as positive is interspersed with like more dangerous and negative it's really interesting to me in that way and i like thinking about what you had just said also about how like well inconvenience is just over like, we didn't conquer it. It's just not our concern anymore. <laughs> and you could kind of see that being the case with, like, wrinkles and sunken cheeks. In either reading, it's like, either we don't care about trying to hide the aging process anymore because there's bigger problems, or, depending on where you go with sunken cheeks, if you're hungry and you have sunken cheeks from hunger, like, maybe everybody does because we're all hungry, and it's just kind of the way things are now. The same way that, like, certain stuff that was in the background of life, like birds or libraries disappearing, could disappear without noticing, like, all of a sudden this is a, a new normal. But it also yeah. interested me that thinking in that way about stuff like, what will end? Well, DMZs will end, demilitarized zones between countries. Is that because war's over? Why is war over? Is it because we've achieved some sort of perfect, harmonious economic peace? No two countries with a McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other, like no liberal <laughs> dream state? Are the trade embargoes over because the transnational flow of goods and services has reached, you know, like optimal peak operating? Or is it because some enormous catastrophe happened and so dmz's are over because society ended and trade embargoes are over because there's no governments to trade with each other and embargo each other's goods anymore i think you could go either way with that and i had yeah. definitely not been going more than one way like when i read through it first i was thinking you know oh this is illustrating how peak capitalism would continue to move towards a never-ending progress at the expense of the natural world basically but i think you're so right that it could also be like this stuff is over because like everything's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's really right. But then at the same time, you do you make a great point that like capitalism, that the like idea of the nation state, which is like 
not exactly natural, but like is like we already see certain instances of like like, you know, the power of the IMF or the World Bank or like the power of certain investment capital, venture capital, whatever, who have like purchased a country's debt, you know, are able through like the international courts to basically hold like a country's boat hostage in a in a whatever. So there's like a way in which the nation state, which had kind of before been like the top most powerful like organizational entity or whatever, is being like superseded by these corporation blah blah blahs. That's also I think a really right way of reading it. There's also so many there's like some weirder ones too. This last part of the list is so interesting. Infiltration plots as dreams oak trees like oak comma trees and trees has this kind of like half rhyme with dreams then we have the two latin terms for the snails and then we have this and this you wouldn't be able to hear but there's like a parentheses and then a bunch of hyphens and then another parentheses and then it says violence prevention programs and then it says news news uh, and then it, it goes to the last two lines. But there's like a lot of different things happening there. And yeah, I was just curious, like, where you thought that was going. I wasn't sure, um, because it does suddenly fragment so strongly. First with the punctuation, you sort of get that like, well, not really first with the punctuation. The first fracture point really is infiltration plot slash dreams, which is sort of a new punctuation, but also just what is that? That's the first non-concrete thing in a long time. I can figure yeah. out what everything else is. Like DMZ's, fine, it's an acronym, or like Mangosteen, maybe I have to look up what that exact fruit is, but I can't look up infiltration plot slash dreams. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that is. Like the closest I can come to is... Like maybe some of the Marxist influenced psychoanalysis guys writing like kind of wild cultural theory and psychoanalysis books about how capitalism like influences your mind, basically, like the the impact of living under capitalism on people. Capitalism and schizophrenia, I think, is a is one of them by Deleuze. These are like not scientific works. They're just <laughs> theoretical works about what living under capitalism does to you. Uh, that's like the closest I get. And the fact that living under a certain economic system, no matter what it is, influences how you think and how you feel. And there's actually, this has also been theorized and studied a little bit for like what different types of government do. There was a book that came out in the 60s. This person who was a psychiatrist, I believe, in Germany began asking people to record their dreams after the Nazis took over and like all of the different dreams that people had like about state power being executed on them uh, or being exercised on them and just like how a change in government could change the way that you dream so in terms of infiltration plot slash dreams maybe it's about how we internalize the times that we live in and how they become a part of us however much we want them to or not so whether that's capitalism or climate crisis or whatever the infiltration plot and your dreams is like whether you're paying attention or not the world is conspiring to enter your subconscious and <laughs> it will reproduce there and you will have to deal with those consequences yeah it is really bizarre i mean it, it makes me think of the word that i kept latching onto is plot which i couldn't get too far with but it made me start thinking in a similar way like under certain systems there are certain plots or narratives that are like central or whatever to or, or become like pretty common. You know, like I think about, I don't know, the the kind of detective cop thriller plot just seems like so important <laughs> to like America <laughs> and capitalism or whatever. Like it's just it's it's been there for so long. And anyway, so I was just. It made me think like maybe there's some kind of an infiltration plot that is like somehow some like interesting central narrative. Yeah. And then with the Latin names, it's just funny because there's different kinds of animal 
Like there's starfish shaped like stars. There's living corals, hispid hairs, leopards, all kinds. Uh, and then there's like these Latin terms for, I don't know. I kept thinking about, I think I just kept going in the, maybe in a similar direction where like what those things are, like the Parchulina variabilis is like not just the animal itself, but like because it's in the species name, it's it's actually the naming system is like sort of highlighted and like the scientific taxonomy is being brought out and that like there's a way of you know whether it's the scientific method like at large or just like there's also like at stake is like the way that we organize and you know name the world or whatever could end and then yeah and then news news it seemed to be like the news is also it's also like not just like the events it's like the news as a concept is ending, like, which in some ways makes me think of like the time that we are living in, there's been both the, you know, the growth of the fake news state, but there's also been the inundation and acceleration of just news, like content being brought to people. Endless streams of raw unedited, yeah. uncurated information. Yeah, like if pushed to where it's going, it, it would become like instead of, you know, reading a newspaper that has this amount of pages or whatever, when you read the news, you just tap, you tap into the huge, you know, data bank in Utah that's just collecting mass amounts of information and you just like sift through endless data or whatever. The concept of breaking news is completely gone. You get breaking if you sign up for news updates from a news app on your phone, which I purposefully do not do because it's very rare that it's actual breaking news. It's like breaking news, something fairly minor happened. And so then the very idea of breaking news, like the latest escalation with Iran, comes through at the same level as like a much less important story and it's all branded as breaking news and it's all the most important thing going on and it's all coming at you right here right now get <laughs> hype um which like yeah we should all care about the news and everything like you should be informed but that that has just completely broken down and in some ways the barriers between news and opinion have broken down in the presentation yeah. particularly on cable news but even in print journalism, the way that people engage with and share news has changed. And people not only can choose what organization they want their news from, they can choose, as they kind of have always been able to do, but now it's sort of amped up to a huge new degree. You can choose to like pull from people who write from a more personal or slanted view, which isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you're aware of what it is and you're critical of them as a voice because of the beliefs you know they already have and the position they're writing from but like that flattening out of news and opinion is a problem because fox will use that as cover they'll say well we have our opinion hosts and we have our news hosts and they're separate but something that the opinion people do will get picked up by the news people and then the news people will be quoted by the opinion people and for the people who are watching it is it really all that different? And which part are they tuning in for? So yeah, the deterioration of the idea of news, I think, is a real thing. And then also where the poem ends up essentially is giving you news. It's news colon, might a few jellyfish survive? Like this is the level of news in the <laughs> like very end times. Um, no mention yeah. of Keith Richards, though I think he'll be there too. Um, <laughs> and then counting till revelations become a part of... So not only does news get reframed as being about jellyfish, it's also this like statement that's as far from what we would categorize as quote unquote news of being, you know, somewhat objective or having a beginning, middle and end or reporting the facts. Like this isn't a fact. This is an incomplete sentence about <laughs> that appears to be referencing the book of revelations or like the end of days. Even there you see the breakdown sort of reaffirmed and happening all over again it also i kept thinking and that, again i don't know if this is part, part of the the joy and the the challenge of poems that are this open uh, in some in some ways is 
I feel some poems I feel like not that I know all the readings, but like I'm like, this is definitely like a reading that I can make. And sometimes I do feel like I'm more fishing. But like counting till revelations become part of it just made me think of like become part of the list of things that end or something. Like and then it's like revelation. <laughs> I don't know. And then I was like, poems are like, obviously many things, but one thing is a kind of revelation. And it's like a kind of an ability to realize something. (laughs) I don't know. And that's like, oh, my God, if that if the which is like sort of what happens with the what we were talking about with the distortion of news is like events and things becoming less able to like approach some threshold of oh this is something uh and like revelation is kind of like a deeper form of news i guess which is like oh this is like the way the world works or like this is the way that i was feeling about the situation or like you know this is like how it actually kind of felt when like this hard thing or great thing happened to me kind of thing which can often be the stuff of poetry and is in some ways, you know, one thing that this poem offers is a, is a kind of like not straightforward revelation, but a kind of revelation about capitalism and climate change and like living in this kind of world is like, Oh, like all of these things are at stake in a genuine way that aren't both very tangible and quite abstract and maybe someday even that ability to be like oh will be gone or something i don't know uh that's pretty bleak but (laughs) incredibly bleak yeah 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 i was gonna ask you i mean you sort of just said this but i was curious what word you would put at the end or what phrase (laughs) And yeah, it sounded like you were saying like part of the list. Yeah, or, or like part of what will end. Yeah, that was my first thought. What were you thinking? <laughs> my first instincts were either history or the past. So it's like the point of rapture and end has already come and gone. So same idea, like it's now part of the list of things that are gone. But yeah, yeah, I, I went in, in a it. very, very similar direction. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. should we read it again let's do it all right romance one by unsung kim like some 14 year old girl waiting for her crush to glance back i keep waiting for capitalism to end but it won't end my adult life lover states on what will end libraries birds Retirement, recess, sprinting during recess, hispid hairs, starfish shaped like stars, inconvenience, wrinkles, sunken cheeks, living corals, protests, anti-nuclear proliferation, non-aggression packs, dragonflies, mangosteen, DMZs, trade embargoes, Leopards, all kinds, saw fins, rewilding, infiltration plot slash dreams, oak, trees, Parchulina variabilis, Parchulina splendida, violence prevention programs, news, news, might a few jellyfish survive? Counting till revelations becomes part of... Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Those reviews help us with the algorithm and are the best way for us to find new listeners. Do you have thoughts about this poem? Or is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? We would love to hear from you, and there are tons, tons of ways to get in touch. 
Yes, you can send us an email to close talking poetry at gmail.com or find us on Twitter. I'm at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. And the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, we are at Close Talking Poetry. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash close talking. And speaking of all of those many and varied social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China. Woo woo. Woo. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Come back again. Please come back. Just one more time. Door is always open. Okay, bye. See ya. <laughs>